Well, I'm guessing, you know, when you look at the end of the year, and maybe FaceTime or visit with your kids or grandkids or great-grandkids, don't we always say they grow up so fast, right? And they do. And they, they never tire of asking for money either. It's amazing. It just <laughs> keeps going that way. A number of years ago, when Lou Holtz was at the University of Arkansas, he was taking his team to play a bowl game in Tempe, Arizona. The game was to be played on Christmas Day. I tell you, we got enough competition as it is, don't we? <laughs> he was asked how he felt about playing a game on Christmas rather than being with his family. And here's how he answered the question. I would rather be in Tempe. After all, once you've been to church, had Christmas dinner, opened the presents, Christmas is the most boring day of the year. I hope they lost the game that day. I really, really do. You know, most people, most of us, are, we're ready to move on to the next holiday. New Year's Eve, tonight, Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, Easter. We're ready to just, you know, get in the car and go away from Christmas. Our attention span is so, our, our attention span is so fleeting. In just seven days, we've gone from angels and shepherds innkeepers and barnyard animals to this Jewish festival of purification. We've gone from the mystical and the holy to the mundane and humdrum religious ceremony. And Mary and Joseph, if a, that entire experience of shepherds in this, shepherds from the, far, from the fields afar and angels in the heavens, they are still amazed at what people are saying about this child. I'm guessing each of us love to hear about how wonderful our kids are, right? Sure. Well, you know, maybe you don't. Maybe you're embarrassed. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, the death knell sometimes is when you meet someone, a stranger, and you're standing in line to go somewhere, and you start talking about your kids and their kids, and they pull out their phone and going through a million pictures that you're standing in line, God help us all. <laughs> but every parent loves to hear how their child will be the one to cure diseases, serve in Congress, join the military, or grow up to be a doctor, lawyer, educator, or a symphony musician. We love people to look their kids in the eyes and say, wow, this kid is special. <laughs> That's why it's my child you're talking about. You know, people are telling Mary and Joseph how wonderful their child is and what great promises that he will fulfill. And their response, they are amazed at what they hear. You know, parents and grandparents, we aunts and uncles, we, we have hopes and dreams for our offspring. You know, in communities around the country, parents are enrolling children in preschools and private ele elementary schools at college prices to give them that head start in life so that they succeed. I looked at one preschool was charging $25,000 a year for a child to go to preschool. I'm in the wrong business, folks. I really am. Preschool. We want our kids to do more than just get by in life. Simeon and Anna saw something in the face of Jesus. Simeon and the crowd at the temple see Jesus for what he brings to the world. They look forward to a future that their eyes and perhaps our eyes will never see. Our passage opens in the temple. Mary and Joseph finangled a date to have a baby dedicated, baptized. And someone's there looking into his eyes to say that this child is special. Kids have a way of manipulating us at times. My granddaughter Ellie was here and she was throwing, I was throwing money into the pool and she dived in and get the pool, get the money. And she had like, you know, 25 different pennies. And she says, can I take them with me to Indiana? I said, no, they got to stay here when you come back again. It's a little Papa Ed, you break my heart, Papa Ed, break my heart. <laughs> I still kept the money, though. I, I... <laughs> Simeon was not fooled by an innocent-looking child. When he takes the baby Jesus in his arms, he's 
He sees something more, and this is what he says about the child. This child is destined to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. And he will be a sign that will be spoken against so that the hearts of many will be revealed. There are two well-known pictures, each with the same title, The Shadow of the Cross. One by Holman Hunt depicts the interior of a carpenter's shop with Joseph and the boy Jesus at work. And Mary is also a present, seated down there on the right-hand side. The boy Jesus pauses in his work as he stretches his arms. The shadow of the cross is formed on the wall. The other picture is a popular engraving which depicts the infant Jesus standing beside his father with the shadow of the cross being cast on the ground. We have to think of this birth in terms of the cross. Not just a cute, little, innocent story that makes us warm and cheerful. After the first Sunday of Christmas, Jesus matures into adulthood at a brisk clip. He, goes, he grows up really fast. Next Sunday, January 7th, is baptism of the Lord's Sunday. And Simeon and Anna, they are not seers. They are observers who believe they've seen the Messiah. The aged Simeon says to Mary, a sword shall pierce through thine own heart also. Remember the image of Mary at the bottom of the cross, her son hanging there, and Jesus says to his beloved disciple, the beloved disciple, you know, you know, take care of my mom, take care of this guy. We romanticize the Christmas story. We shut the barn door and halt where the story ultimately ends. We like the, the beauty of it, the simplicity of it, without the extra chapters that go along with it. It's a boring day if we only experience football, food, fellowship, and a day off. Our future becomes more interesting when embracing where the story leads. This is the story of salvation. Christmas is a starting line for salvation. We seem to have closed the book on the tragic chapter which places the cross over the Bethlehem cradle. Society has stripped the cross from Christmas. Simeon and Anna were two regular worshipers at the temple. And they have something to say about the Holy Family. Simeon, and the other is a name, a widow named Anna. And some years back, Simeon heard the voice of God, the Holy Spirit speaking to him. Yes, you will not taste death, the Spirit told him, until you've seen the Messiah with your own eyes. The old guy's been looking for the Messiah ever since. There are things that we look for in our lives before that final breath is taken. It may be a sign of hope. It may be a fractured relationship that needs to be healed. We're looking for something in our lives. And when Simeon gets to the temple that day, he sees no powerful orator, no victorious general, just a tradesman from the North Country and his young wife. And they're cradling a baby in their arms. Who can say how Simeon knows this child to be the one? But he does. And Luke simply tells us, and this is throughout Luke, the Holy Spirit is prevalent in the book of Luke. He is led by the Spirit. Did Simeon's heart burn within him as he looked upon the baby? He had the, a sixth sense, some weird ability to discern halos as some Gilded Renaissance pain. We know even less about Anna than we do Simeon. All Luke tells us that she's a widow. She's in her 80s. She comes to the temple every day to pray and stays well into the night. That's her life. That's what she does now as a widow. Anna sits there in the outer court of the temple in her accustomed spot, like all of us have our accustomed spots, eyes closed, lips pursed, intoning over and over the words of the psalm. Her life becomes deeper spiritually. She's looking for something that is promised. And there are worshipers who come regularly to the temple, but none are more regular than Anna. She has become a familiar sight to those who pass by her, a deeply pious woman who keeps to herself. And on this day, she stops in mid-prayer. Her eyes rest on that oh-so-young mother and her newborn son. He's the one, she announces. He's the one with breathless excitement. He's the one who will redeem Israel. And so there you have it, two pious and holy individuals 
Simeon and Anna would be unknown to us were it not for the singular incident in Luke's gospel. So, so why does Luke include this story? I mean, it's kind of a long passage that we read. Simeon somehow knows Mary's life as a mother will be one of indescribable joy, but also gut-wrenching pain. You know, whenever you become a parent, it, there, there are highs and there are lows. There are good days and there are bad days. There are days that you just wish would never have happened. And there are days that you wish you could treasure forever. It's not exactly the sort of thing you write inside a new baby congratulations card, but Simeon pulls no punches. He tells it like it is, with the frank speech typical of the elderly. He had no filter that day. He doesn't want this sweet young woman to be unprepared when her life turns tragic. Soak it all in, he's saying to Mary, all of it, the bad as well as the good. For you can hardly expect to have the full experience of being human, especially as a mother, without knowing heartache as well as joy. It's a common thing these days, especially for us as we get up in years. We criticize the youth around us. We look at how they make decisions, what their priorities are. And you know, we think it's nothing but gloom and doom. And I got news for you. We're saying the same thing about the young generation that our parents said about us growing up. In his song, Simeon's song, the good clearly, clearly triumphs, even the sword that will pierce Mary's soul is but a passing reveal. Yet for others of us who are north of middle age, it can be all too easy to play the ain't it awful kind of game. What do we say about the younger generation? They spend all their time on smartphones. I've been to dinner and lunch in Naples. It's not just the young kids on the smartphones. <laughs> this younger generation doesn't know how to hold down a job. Their work ethic's horrible. This younger generation wears their pants too low. Our generation wears them too high. That's what I do. <laughs> I kind of like that one myself. I mean, this younger generation doesn't know the difference between a salad fork and a dinner fork. This younger generation doesn't appreciate all the hard work we put in to get them to where they are today. And this whole story is kind of refreshing, isn't it? Simeon looking into the eyes of baby Jesus, praising God and saying, my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, one of the greatest gifts that I think the older generation can offer to the young is just the same way. It's this gift of hope. It really is. There's a, I forget who said it, but every time a child is born in the world, it's God's way of showing hope for humanity. I kind of like that. It's a rare gift because for whatever reason, a lot of us tend to get grumpy in our old age. And those of us who are younger, we will fight that tendency in the future ourselves. We grieve for times past, despair the present, and look with trepidation on the days to come. And not all those fears and trepidations have much basis in reality. Can you imagine how the biblical story would be different had Simeon and Anna focused on the bad things that were happening all around them? Nobody could dispute it. We can look at 2023, we can focus on all the bad things, it would be a dark rain cloud that would follow us in 2024. As a people of hope, we focus on what the goodness that God has given to us. If we're People have just, and I've told you this story before, you know, I was a chaplain in the National Guard. They would go around and say, well, chaplain, what do you got to say? I always had a word of hope. If I'd say, well, sir, we're all screwed, that's not what you want to say. <laughs> no, at that time, there was disease and famine and banditry and slavery. Life expectancy was short. The Roman overlords were stepping up their oppressions of the Jewish people. There was no shortage of bad things to commiserate about. And yet when these two wise elders of Israel catch a glimpse of the baby Jesus in his mother's arms, they zero in on the tremendous potential for good present in this child who is the Son of God. 
as elders. I mean, age-wise as elders. Can we change our direction and focus on the good? And focus on the hope? And have encouraging words? Instead of being the Mrs. Kravitz of the world? The Son of God, born in their very midst, who could have imagined it would happen in their lifetimes? It's all in how we look at it. If Christmas teaches us anything, there's more potential in the birth of a baby than in any threat, real or imagined, we could ever dream of. And when that baby is the Son of God, the powers of death and disorder flee in disarray. Listen well to the word from Simeon and Anna. It's a word from the truly wise. Christmas Day is not boring. The Christian life is not boring. The life of Jesus and the life of a Christian is full of hope and promise, and that's the message in this story. So my three questions are, are you a person of hope? Are you a negative person? And if you are, why? Amen. Oh, Carolson. Two Carols. We're not talking Carol Franks or, but two Carols. Name one, name two. Joy of the World. In the Bleak Moon Winter. Okay, Joy of the World, the first, first one verse, two verses? Two verses. Pull out your hymnal, look in the index. There's an old, there's a thing underneath your chair is called a book. It's a hymnal. Uh, there's an index in the back. 